Okay, let's go ahead and begin in a word of prayer. We have several watching, and so, all right, let's begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, and we praise you for who you are. Father, we ask that your name would be set apart. We ask that you would reveal to us who you are, that we would know that you are Lord. And Father, I just pray tonight as we study your word and we look at this process that we would grow in grace, that you give us understanding. I pray that the students can work together, that we, uh, that we can finish the semester strong. I pray for those that are tired and those that are, are struggling, that you would encourage them and strengthen them. Father, I pray now that you be with us. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. Okay, great. All right, so what we're going to do is we are going to, we are going to review, okay? So I wanna, the first thing I want to do is I want to review the process. And then we're also going to, we're also going to, I want you to start working on your assignments. I want to sit down with, with each person here tonight so we can split up into groups to work together and and I want to get us back on track. So we will, and we'll also do a little bit of new material. So we will do, I'll share with you some of the new homework assignments. And so we'll do a little bit of review. We'll do a little bit of some new material. And then we'll also, I want you to start working on the assignments and, and I'll, I'm gonna work with each one of you there. So, okay, cool. Okay, so what we'll do first is I want to review I want to review the method. I, I prepared, I did, did, was everyone able to print this out? Or at least you have a copy? I hope everyone was able to print this out, okay? All right, now, I am, I am not expecting you to be this good, okay? This is an example. Please, I don't want you to be stressed, okay? This is an example and a pattern to follow. And I, I hope that you can see this and use this as an example in the future. So uh, I don't want you to be stressed. So we'll do, what we're gonna do first is we're going to, to work through this assignment and talk through it. Not this assignment, we're gonna work through this example and talk through it. And then we're also going to uh, give you some new assignments. Tonight, I really want to lay for you the rest of the new assignments and for the rest of the semester and then um we'll slowly work towards completing them and then really what it the way it's going to work is your assignments there's going to be i think 13 assignments okay you'll, you'll work through the 13 assignments and then i'm going to give you feedback and then your final project will just be resubmitting those assignments as one as one group okay like like a paper all right so it shouldn't be so stressful if i just gave you the paper to do by yourself you could not do it but if you just each each week every three or four days do something and then we can bring it together okay and so this will be the, the the culmination of your work so let's go ahead if you have the printout i'll open up mine okay here's my printout and so i, I hope that you can start taking notes as i work through here Please ask a question, all right? So the, this paper is literally the 13 assignments. So I've done those 13 assignments that, I, that I've, I've already assigned you nine. I believe that there's going to be four more. They're not so hard. So do not, please do not be stressed, okay? Please do not be stressed, all right? This big picture here, all right? I hope everyone can see that. I'll work through it. We're moving from observation to application, okay? So literally, the big picture here is hermeneutics is interpretation, all right? And to be honest with you, what typically hermeneutics is, when it's taught, they go through all these different genres, they give you clues and hints, and, and that's good, but, but I feel as if, my perspective is if you don't have a good uh, structure or pattern or if you don't see how all this fits it's not as helpful to give you all these different genres and highlights and all these things because at the end of the day you can't put it together all right so what I've done for you is I have given you the full range the full range of all the things that the, the major things that you should consider we could perhaps add some things to this I, I don't have I hope by the end of the semester 
that I'll have notes on each one of these steps. And then once you're completed, once you have a grade for the course, I will send you those notes, okay? So that's, that's the long-term goal, hopefully by January, so that you can use them in your own uh, preparation. So, so looking here, just to give you the big picture, uh, we have number one, spiritual preparation. You've done that. Passage selection, so you're going to select your passage. Uh, you're going to identify your passage in relationship to, to salvation history. You're going to discuss and identif identify and discuss the genre. So it's nothing more than probably three sentences. You're going to do a background study, a context study, which you've already, you should have already done or, or, or in the process of doing. Uh, asking important questions. This is go this here, thinking issues, sorry. Team, yeah. Mr. Team end of the class, we will be submitting to you like this one. That's the, yeah, that you will submit just like that. I will, I will prepare a template and you can just add in your assignments once you make any adjustments for my recommendations or comments. But you'll just be caught, that's when you can copy and paste from your, from your assignment into your into your, your project. I will prepare a template like this for you, yeah. All right, so just, I, I'm just gonna highlight the big, the, big, the big picture work through here. So spiritual preparation, number one, passage selection, number two, location and salvation history, very, very basic, just where you are. Genre identification, we talked about how there's, there's the, the genre, and then also typically a subgenre. Can everyone see this? Yeah. We, we can see it. Okay, big picture. Let's let's take a, let, let, let me let's start the class over. Okay, all right. So what what I've done here is many times uh, going back to what I said before in hermeneutics, you're given so many different genres, you're given so many different clues how to study each genre, but there isn't this concise method of how do you combine these different studies. If I can't do all the studies, what should I admit? There isn't just this type of, there isn't a pattern. So I really wanted to give you a pattern. And so really, this is the big picture moving from observation, which is the bulk, that's the, most of your work, to then explaining and then to applying it, okay? So if you look down here, this is the pinnacle of your study, the big idea. How do we increase? include Christ in the gospel? How do we have a homiletical outline? How do we include illustrations, application, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So uh, let's just, I want to, now that you've seen this big idea, I do want to just review and just talk through this just so that I'm bringing you back to, to focus where we're at, okay? Sometimes we can get lost in the weeds. We spent about four weeks studying structure analysis, and that's been a lot of stress for, 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 for many of you. And so zooming in here now, uh, this, this should not be hard. Neither should this, uh, location, salvation, history. When what I was saying was genre really has two. It has the, the main genre, and then often there is a subgenre, the genre in your specific text, okay? So for example, you could be in the main genre of gospels and then the subgenre of parable okay so there's typically two genres all right you can be in the genre of prophetic literature but then the specific subgenre is like a prayer or a benediction or, or something like that or a vision okay so there, there can be genres and subgenres and again genre is referring to this is referring to structure Okay. Background study is dealing with back, uh, um, contextual issues in, in the original context. What's going on in the church? What's, what's, the, what's the setting? Or what's the, let's change setting the situation. Okay. 
what's the situation, all right? Context study is really, uh, really understanding where you are in the book itself. This is almost like studying a map, okay? Now, think about this for a second. If you're doing, if you're doing a small group Bible study through, a, through a, a book, if you're preaching through a book, you really only have to do this one time. So let's just, if you're doing, uh, book study for uh, teaching or preaching. Think about this. This will, this will be, this will be one time. This will be one time. Okay. So you won't have to do it all the time because the next week you're just building upon the previous week. So that's why expository preaching actually can be very beneficial because a lot of this, this is one time, this will be one time. Okay. It'll be, you won't have to do this because it's already chosen. All right. So, so these things become easy. All right. These, these two making, asking important questions, making observations, this prepares you to then do your word study and your structure analysis, okay? All right. Now, is, is Sonny here or no? Where's Sonny? Sonny's not here yet, okay. I've included, I've included two other uh, things that this is not required. I, I have a note here, advanced hermeneutics, okay? All right, this is not required, okay? But if you were, <laughs> if you were, some people, because they're going for the translation, you're going from uh, Greek, to English, or perhaps uh, Tagalog, or Cebuano, or Waray. If you're dealing with language, okay, you're working, you're working the language. This would be the place where you want to do, where you want to do it, okay. You want to do the translation after you do the word study, okay? Not before, all right? Because you're applying your word studies into the translation, okay? If you want to do like a preemptive looking at the text, that's fine. Again, I don't do this all the time. If I don't have a time, I'm not expecting anyone to do this, okay? This is if you wanted to go deep, really deep, okay? The other thing that I've included, just because if you'd want to do this, is if you're doing, so for example, in our context, Habakkuk 2.4 is the passage cited in Romans 1, 16, 17. This would be the time for you to study Habakkuk's context, okay? But again, I'm not, I'm not requiring that at all, okay? That's advanced hermeneutics, okay? So if ever there is a, if this is dealing with, Old Testament citations or in some cases scripture citing scripture and actually I don't know if New Testament use of the of the old is the best reference because here you have the prophets you have the prophets citing the, the citing the Pentateuch Okay, you have the historical book citing the law, all right? So New Testament use of the old might be, might be deficient. Perhaps we should really do like a, a scripture citing scripture study. 
Because in places of scripture in the Psalms, in the Psalms, they're citing the law. Okay? But again, this is beyond the scope of this class. In your preaching, you don't have to do this. Um, but this would be the place. Okay? And, and, and then we have this structure analysis, okay? We have a structure analysis. Henry asked an excellent question. He said, well, what about intra and inter-sentence analysis? Can you do both? And I said, yes. Uh, intra-sentence is looking inside. So we could say micro. So looking inside, going deep. This is a micro study, like a microscope. Inter sentence is, is, uh, between sentences. This is like a big picture. And so this is macro. That's macro, macro, big, think macro, big, okay? Just think in the U.S., they have what's called a Mack truck. It's big. <clears throat> in Bible study, uh, in Bible study, the best is to use inter-sentence. Yeah, so if or... you're... So the ultimate best is to use both. <laughs> That's the best. But if you had to choose between the two, inter-sentence is better because you're looking at the, the main types of sentences. Meaning to say you could go into the intra-sentence and you could miss <coughs> the big idea of a command, of a promise, because you're, you're not seeing that big picture. So yes, if you can only do one, inter-sentence is better. Yes, that's good, good. Yeah, in doing inter sentence, uh, inter sentence for Bible study, it allows the, the, the group to do intra sentence. Yes, no, that's also true. That's also true. Yeah. So just big, big picture here now, okay? You're going to have many questions here. And so the questions set you up to, to do the word study. Um, and then also this, this structure analysis. You'll see my questions. We're going to work through Romans, just working through the big picture. But you're going to see many of my questions are answered in the structure analysis. I think we already showed that in the past. Okay? Um, and also word study is going to answer the other questions. Okay? Um, from this... This then, this is why it's more important. The intersentence, from the intersentence, you create the exegetical. That's why it's more important, yeah. And then the exegetical outline, you're going to then create it also into a summary. So do you see how it's just building, okay? So the inter-sentence, so if you can imagine here, I'm going to build this on the side. This is inter-sentence. And then on, built on this is the outline. And then built on this is the summary. Okay? You're just going up. Okay? So if you're not, if you're not... <laughs> If you don't understand the structure, it's very difficult for you to have an exegetically based outline, sermonic outline. Very difficult. Very difficult. And so even though this by far, I'm going to be honest with you, this by far, this is, this is very time consuming. But... If I could only do, if I, if I could only spend the majority of my time before I preach or I teach, 
the, the two things I'm spending the most time on, even more so than a background and a context. Well, the context study is really important, but really uh, those are the two most important, word study and structure analysis. And just, just with a context study, just let me, let, me, let me make it lighter so it's not as important. Just being aware, just being aware of what's going on. Just, just being aware of the genre, being aware of the background, some of the issues, where you are in the passage. Okay, from, once you have the exegetical summary, I'm gonna be honest with you, once you have the exegetical summary, this, this should be very fast. It should not be a long time. If, if this is a long time and it's hard for you to do, then perhaps you don't really understand the, the word study, the, the structure analysis, maybe there, there's some struggle. And to be fair, you know, maybe it takes some time before you get really good, but if you have a good grasp on the structure, you have a good grasp on the word meanings, then, then this section should be fast, okay? Here you're listing, you're, you're uh, listing a theological, eternal truths. All right, that this the passage is teaching. Okay, these could be statements that you want to include so that people really you want to be concise. Okay, so these these should be. Very clear, you'll see in my example, they're very clear statements. And, and when you see what I'm writing, you're like, okay, Tim, that, that makes sense. That's not really difficult, and, and, and it shouldn't be. But we need to list them out so that we're clear when we're preaching before the people, okay? I've also include, this is the same thing. So here, you're specifically making statements about Christ that the passage is teaching. Okay, maybe it's only teaching one, that's fine. Maybe it's teaching four, that's fine. Maybe two or three are implied, include them. If they're implied, you have to identify that because your, your readers will not pick up on it, okay? So this could be uh, explicit, or implied. Okay. Once you have, once you have all of these, okay. Up until here, pretty much, you have all the information that you need. Okay. These are these. You can also say are maybe these are deductions. Okay, we could say that they're deductions from the previous context, okay? And then look here, exposition, this is literally now just explaining. You're explaining, okay? Now, some people are very good, and when you go into preaching, you can just, you can just wing it, <laughs> okay? Um, Sometimes that's good. Uh, it, it, it is good to take a half an hour, 20 minutes, and, and just write out what the passage means in your own words. So what I like to do here with explaining this in your own words is each phrase, each clause, each sentence should be explained. Okay, is everyone tracking with me? Any questions? Uh, just for those who came in, I saw some people come in a little bit later. This handout I emailed, I also posted. I'm just going through it for everyone's benefit um, because this is the pattern by which you can preach and you can teach. So this, uh, this, this pattern, I use this pattern all the time when I preach or teach, okay? And if I don't actually write out everything or type everything out, I'm thinking through this pattern, okay? All right, so here, this, this, uh, 
I'm not doing, there's no research, okay? At this point, there's no research, all right? So when you're preparing, there, be, there will be an assignment for you to exposit or explain your passage. I think it's assignment number 12 or 11. I think it's 11. I don't want any, any footnotes. I don't want any, you know, John MacArthur says this. Charles Stanley says this. This is in your own words. You're just explaining the passage yourself, okay? And I would argue, I would submit to you that when you get hung up, like, okay, I can't explain this, that means that you need to go back and work a little more on the exegesis, okay? By this point, you're just bringing things together. If you're, if you're an investigator, we do have some lawyers in our class. This is, this is, you are no longer investigating. Now you are preparing your case. <laughs> you're gathering, you're pulling together the observations, you're making the, the, the propositions, you're making the, the conclusions, you're making the inferences. Once you have the exposition, once you have the theological truths, then you are prepared to make your theological outline and summary. So you're moving from, so if you can imagine here, this is your exegetical outline and summary. Now you're moving to a theological. This is eternal. These are, these are truths that never change. And then homiletical will be this is homiletical. This is our context. But this is important, especially in the Old Testament, especially in the Gospels, especially in the law. Okay? Uh, when you're in the New Testament, these become closer. Okay? But... The other thing, too, is that you're always, Christ is here. So you never want to go, you never want to go from here to here. Never. You always, what are the theological truths? What are the truths about Christ? Ah, okay, then I'm going to work down here. All right. Never, never go direct. This is a big no-no. <laughs> okay. You need to think, okay, what is God teaching us eternally or universally? A truth that is, is true for all ages. It's no longer time-bound. It's timeless. We could say timeless. Okay? What are those theological truths, and what are those truths about Christ? Okay? And then... And then we're, then we're taking those truths about Christ, we're taking those truths about, about God, and now we're going to apply them into our context, okay? So then from this now, you get, once, once you're there, the big idea should just jump out at you. It should just be so clear. Or maybe it's still a struggle to, to use the nice words, but at least you have a very good understanding. With the big idea, and we'll see this later in the example, you should have a main subject or statement. We're saying subject as in there's a, uh, a main statement, and then there's this uh, complement. Okay? There's a relationship and complement. And, and we'll see an example in a minute, okay? The next that we're doing is now we're going to look at where can we put, where can we include the gospel and Christ in this passage? Maybe it's in an illustration. Maybe it's in a sub point, okay? But we always need to be thinking, where is Christ and the gospel going to be put? Not, we're not eisegeting, okay? We're looking at a relationship. How does Christ relate? Is it, is, it, is it an example? Is it a fulfillment? Is it a command? Okay? 
there is always going to be some type of relationship to Christ and the gospel. And the other thing we need to do, because there's always going to be some type of relationship, we should also explicitly list the gospel. Because there's always going to be someone in the church, in your congregation, that is an unbeliever. All right? And they, can, they cannot succeed in doing what you're calling them to do, doing what the text is calling them to do, if they don't hear the call of the gospel. Okay? Now, this is not a homiletics class, so I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on this because really, to be honest with you, uh, you, you see the word theology, you see the word homiletics down here, right? You see the word homiletics down here. This outline you will see again in homiletics and you will see it again in some of our theology courses. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're always, you know, in many ways, I mean, this is so foundational. This will be so foundational to EVST forever. If you're in my class forever, you are going to be, we're going to be looking at this. If we're doing a book study, we're doing a book study. We're going to be focusing in on, on in a book study, we're focusing on, on this section, but perhaps I'll make you write a sermon out. And you're, you know, you see what I'm saying? Because if you can see here, exegesis always ends in homiletics or in the practical. It always ends in the practical. So if I'm going to draw a diagram, you've seen this before. Okay, so here, this is your observe. This is your explain. This is your apply. Okay. Now this is, this is the end. This is the, it doesn't, this is a, this doesn't make sense, but it is. Okay. The more you want to be practical, the more you need to be exegetical. <laughs> Think about that. The more you want to be practical, the more you need to be exegetical. That doesn't make sense. You'd be like, Tim, that doesn't make sense. It does. It's like, it's like this, the stronger the building you want to have, the more you have to strengthen the foundation. All right? So people, pastors have this burden. I want to make it practical for my congregation. Then you better spend triple the time on the exegesis. I assure you, I'm telling you, personal testimony, okay? I'm, I'm in a pastor's family, okay? So I started, my dad started preaching me, having us preach and teach. You know, there was a period of time in my youth where I was not focused on God. And so, you know, he couldn't, you know, it was a struggle and, and that was my sin. But there became a place where I really wanted, to, you know, the Lord got a hold of my heart, whether I had a revival or whether I was truly born again. Uh, I honestly go back and forth on that, but there is definitely a revival, a rededication in my life. And after that, my dad had me preach, had me teach everything, okay? I preached and taught for at least uh, uh, three to four years before I went to seminary, okay? And I wanted to be so practical, and my sermons were bad. <laughs> they, were, they were, I look back and I cringe at some of my sermons. The more I became exegetical, it just flew. It just uh, flowed. It just flowed, okay? Now, I don't want to... There is also a sense in which it's like a pendulum, okay? All right? So, so we can be too practical or we can be too theological. We, we, we just, 
we, 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 we start climbing, if this is a ladder, right? So we're, we're, we're climbing up, going to here, and then we just, we stop there. We, we stop, we stop here. It's such a beautiful truth. We're just going to stop there. No, we must go on. We must go on to the pinnacle, okay? And so there's always this, we're trying to get to equilibrium here, but there's always this tendency. There's always this tendency, okay? So it's always a balance for us, all right? So let's, let's just finish up here, okay? So we're going to do, we're going to do the there's a, go there's a principle of this thing on the pendulum. What's that? The displacement, the displacement on, on the opposite side is equal to the displacement on the other side. Yes, that is true. That is true. And so you want to know the one who is going to, to stop that, who's going to balance that, who is the one that can stop it? Makes it <laughs> Who is it, Sonny? The exigent. <laughs> yeah, the exigent. And I was going to say, well, because we're the pendulum, okay? This is us. So we can't stop the pendulum. The Holy Spirit. We need to pray for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we're going to be swinging. We're going to be swinging, right? So we ask God. This is where, this is where the prayer. That's why that we start with the prayer. That the Holy Spirit would lead us and interpret and guide us you know and so there's of course there's our we have the role to play but also the holy spirit and so um yeah we are responsible our bad interpretation i don't want to take away from our our bad our bad you know it's, it's there's responsibility but there's also this the holy the work of the holy spirit we can't minimize that okay all right so we're looking at here we're almost finished okay once you have the big idea you can come up with the, the homiletical outline. Once you have the homiletical outline, now you can look at illustrations. Now you can look at application, okay? We'll touch on this. Maybe I'll have a handout on illustrations and application. And then look at this. Last, introduction, conclusion. And if you want to include number six, title. Masters who start with the title. We've all been there. Who is guilty of this? I am guilty. I raise my hand. We all should raise our hand. We all raise our hand. I raise my hand, okay? Uh, but really, the intro, the conclusion, and the title should be the very end. It's at the very last moment when you have brought everything together that you create your introduction, you create your conclusion, and you create your title. And when people are making a book, that's actually the case. The introduction, the conclusion, and the title go at the very, very end. The very, very end. Because it's when you see that big picture, when you see the full shebang, you say, ah, okay, now I'm going, I know what to do, okay? All right, any questions or comments, I'm gonna quickly, Let's take a break and then we're just gonna work through this really quick and then we're gonna work on some of your assignments tonight. Any questions or comments? We'll take a break now, it's already 6.51. Any questions or comments? So Tim, is this the revised version of the one that you've sent? Uh, yes, so I, uh, this is the revised for the, uh, the paper here. And really, this, is a, this could be a revised, I need to revise the handout for the concise method that I sent that I sent to you, yes. I'm just gonna quickly go through here and just highlight a couple things, and then what we'll do is we'll split into groups. I want to talk with, um, so that you can start doing your assignments, and actually, we're going to have a Zoom call on Thursday for anyone who can come, and Thursday night from seven to, from seven to nine will be like a workshop where I'll have my Zoom call up and running, you can work on your assignment, like, like maybe like a, a library a session time. You can work on your assignment. And then if you have a question or you need help with your assignment, I will be available 
and then we can do we can do a breakout session where we work together okay so uh, that's what we'll start doing every Thursday it's totally optional there'll be no new content it's just for those who need help in their assignments I will make myself available on on thir Thursday <laughs> on the zoom call okay this is essentially the the format that I'll send what I'm going to do is um, each assignment you need to turn in and then I will make comments on your assignments and then send them back to you and then you're going to resubmit one big document like this i will i will prepare the 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 um the headers and also the formatting so that all you have to do is type all you have to do is type okay or you can copy paste all right uh so we have here uh, uh observe it spiritual preparation so just several things that i want to highlight here to remind you we're asking specifically first to um uh we have to be uh number one we need to have asked forgiveness of our sins so that we're in the right relationship to be able to, to to study god's word i'm also looking that you would ask for prayer as you interpret um the word uh, so i think most most of you have done this assignment but for those of you who have not yet done them uh, also asking that um, that we, we would less and less want our desires and thoughts and opinions to be present and that we would see Christ, his word, his command uh, to be exalted. And then also that we're, we're praying for um, uh, faithfulness in our interpretation. And then we're also asking that the gospel would be proclaimed. Okay. So if you've already done this assignment, great. Just be sure that when you resubmit it, that those five things are present for asking uh, forgiveness of sin, asking and interpreting the word, asking that you would be faithful to the context, uh, asking that our opinions would be less, that, that God's will and word would be exalted. And then also that, the gospel is proclaimed in the preaching. Okay, so it's very important, all right? Then we have just this <clears throat> statement of what passage that you are going to be uh, interpreting. And then in this location of salvation history, I am specifically looking for a statement about this. I am looking for a time statement. I'm looking for a time statement in relationship to the crucifixion, resurrection, exaltation, and enthronement of Jesus, and then a brief explanation of it. All right? So some people talk about maybe they're expositing the text in this section, or maybe they're talking about different things, but I'm specifically looking at the, the time in reference to this. And then an explanation of how that, so the explanation is what is the impact? What is the impact of this time reference? Okay, so is everyone tracking with what I'm looking for there? You're going to describe to me where it is and then how it impacts the exegetical process okay what is the impact all right next is genre identification so notice here i identified my mine as epistolary genre and then i actually changed i actually changed this so i reserved the right to change my answer <laughs> so actually the subgenre I had is epistolary, which is still accurate in the sense that it's in the epistolary genre, but I want to get more specific. And so the more specific is it's in this theological discourse section. Um, as in contrast to the, exhort, the exhortative 
the subgenre in Romans 12 and following. So, so I liked what Sonny said on Sunday night. Sonny got the gold star. And so there is this really two subgenres in, in Romans. And you can see it. In this exhortative subgenre, there's a lot of commands. There's very little commands in Romans 1 to 12. There's a lot of explanation. All right, so there's clearly, if you read both, there's clearly a shift from Romans 1 to 11 to 12 to 16. There's just this shift, okay? Background study, I want you to have a discussion in the author, the, the addressees, the composition, the date, perhaps purpose. There's some other examples I gave. So this is what's going on in the, the background study. And, and I said here that I wanted, now let me take a step back. For those of you in the TH100, again, you can do this in bullet points, all right? So if I want three points, then you need three bullet points. If I want 20 points or 20 sentences, I want 20 bullet points, okay? So in the assignment, I was looking for 20 sentences or this was um, five paragraphs at four sentences, or it could be four paragraphs at five sentences, but I was looking for this 20 sentence discussion, okay? So you can have it for the, for the certificate of theology, you can have bullet points, but I'm just looking for that 20, that the, the, those, those 20 sentences, those 20 bullet points, okay? Um, context study. So I'm looking for an outline of your book. Uh, don't create it yourself. Find it. If you need help finding it, I'm here Thursday night. I can help you find an outline, okay? So you're just looking for an outline and you're looking for it to be at least too deep. So this is one, this is two, okay? If it's a short book, I'm looking for three. So this would be A, B, C. Okay, so that, that's, this is three deep, all right? Any questions or comments? So then here, location, you're just describing the location. You're giving just a, a, a summary of the preceding context. You're giving a summary of the succeeding context. Um, and that's it, okay? Asking important questions. Um, I gave an option between, uh, so there's more of you that have not yet completed this. I'm looking for, in this section, I'm looking for 20 points. This and also this. Okay. So you could, you could have 12 questions, eight observations. You could have 15 questions, five observations. You could have five questions, 15 observations, okay? But I'm just, in the assignment, I'm looking for that 20 points. Next, we have a word study, and the word study was very specific, so I won't repeat it here. I gave the, I gave the template for you to do. So um, just follow that template if you have a question. Um, again, this is just an example. This is a little more complicated because, again, I want to give you a pattern that you can use in the future. And then after the, after the word study, you're doing a structure analysis. So in the structure analysis, in your inter, intra sentence analysis, this is all I'm expecting from you, okay? And you don't have to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. It's fine. I'm just looking that you did an honest attempt and that you and that you you try to identify actors uh, verbs or actions objects and then relationships and descriptions of verbs and and also nouns okay that's it you know I might mark up your paper as long as you made an honest effort, you're going to get full or most, if not all, credit. Okay, I'll mark up the paper so you can make the modification when you resubmit. Okay, but this is literally all you need to do. Now here, 
You don't have to try to do this on your computer. You can either handwrite out the text and then use markers by, you know, <clears throat> uh, or you can use, you can follow, if you notice here, um, you can just follow the, the, the patterns. You don't, you don't even have to have colors because you have different, you have different types. You have dash, you have double, you have um, parentheses like that. So again, this is all I'm expecting from you. You can write it out and then just take a good picture and, and, and message it to me, or you can email it to me, okay? All right, and then the, the, the inter sentence, the inter sentence, this is all I'm looking for, okay? Again, you're, you're gonna have, you're having a major description of the main, and then you're having this relationship here, okay? Now I included, I included both for your benefit. I will do this when I'm doing it, but you don't have to do it. You literally can just have one, two, three, four. Let's just say I'm working this out. You don't have to include these, okay? You can if you want to. And, it, and, and, and to be honest with you, it'll make it better sense, okay? But, but even dealing with block diagrams, all those different things, I'm not requiring that because it's, we're, we're at the, the, the I want to keep us at a certain level, okay? So if you want to go and give the block diagram, fine. So really what I'm looking at, literally what I'm looking at is I'm treating this as one sentence and this as one sentence, okay? So you could just have verse 16, let's say Romans is your example. You could just have verse 16, it's a, it's a state. Verse 17, it's an action. Relationship, idea, explanation, okay? That's it. All right, now, now, now I am looking for you. Now, uh, I am looking for a little bit more here. So perhaps you want to do the block diagram. Um, but now I'm looking for the uh, exegetical outline, okay? Now, again, you don't have to. And if, you, and if you're, you're exegetical with the sub points is not as good, again, this is an introductory course, so I'm not expecting you to get, I'm not expecting you to have this amazing outline like I have here, okay? If you do, great, all right? What I, what I would be expecting for is at least a main, main point, at least two main points, and then at least two major sub points, okay? That's all I'm expecting from you, all right? And there should be, this should be the foundation, all right? Any questions or comments? Are you, let me get a poll here. Are you feeling stressed or are you feeling a little bit better? Honestly, Pastor, yeah. stressed. <laughs> no, not this, not the stress, distress. <laughs> To me, it, it, it's a challenge. To me, I'm challenged. When we did this last night with Danny, it was a very challenging uh, exercise. So it, it seems to me that the biggest stress for everyone will be the intra, the inter, and then the exegetical. Yeah. I think yeah. the theological will be easy, the homiletical will be easy. So what we're going to do is on Thursday night, it's optional, but you can come. Let's, let's come together as a workshop. Bring your text printed out or written out and, and maybe several copies or one copy. And then I will, for those who need help, I will work with you on your passage. Okay? So we will have two hours. Um, each person can work separately. And then we will work on your passages. Okay? So every week, unless I have something that comes up, I will set aside Thursday evening as this workshop to work with you, okay? So I don't want you to be stressed. Um, my grading here, I am not grading you on whether or not you're accurate, although I want you to be. I'm grading it more on completion. Does everyone understand here? So 
Um, uh, please don't be stressed. Uh, let, let's, once we finish working through this handout here, I'm, I'm going to have you start, I'm going to have each one of you pick us an assignment. You'll have a partner to work with. Pick an assignment that you can start working on tonight from our assignments that are due. Okay? All right, so I'll have the, the, the last hour, I will break you out to start working on an assignment that you're struggling with. So it's almost as if Thursday will begin tonight. Okay? I, I think that as we start practicing, you'll become less stressed. All right? So let's move on here, okay? Um, once you have your exegetical outline, all that you're doing here now is this is just a summary, okay? It's just a summary. And, and the benefit here is that you're putting into words the outline because then this is, this will go into the theological summary, and then this will become the big idea. All right? So that's why you're moving from an outline to a, a summary, and then into this big idea, okay? All right. <clears throat> it explain it. All you're doing now is you're listing, this is the new content, okay? This is new content here. You're listing theological truths, okay? You're listing theological truths. So for example, number one truth that I have here, let's look at this number one, this number one truth. Uh, the gospel contains God's power to save us from his coming wrath and judgment. Okay. That's a theological truth that I'm developing. I'm giving a little bit more information than what's in the text. Okay. If you notice here, I'm defining salvation. I'm making a connection of salvation from God's judgment and wrath. And this here is found in Romans 1, 18 to 3, 19. Okay, so I'm making a theological statement. This is true. This, for those of you in the Bible's big story, God's judgment is always there. There's always this judgment. And, and if, if you recall, the promise to the woman is to undo the curse of the serpent. Okay? And to undo this judgment that has been, this curse that has been pronounced of death. Okay? So that's one theological statement. So this is, a, a, this is true through all the ages, all right? The gospel, which Eve clung to, which Noah clung to, which Abraham clung to, which, which Israel and Moses and David and, and all of those that believed, this is the gospel. It's the salvation from God's coming wrath and judgment. Number two. Salvation is by faith alone. That's a theological statement. I'm making the connection that salvation is given to everyone who is believing, to the Jew and also to the Greek. There's no reference to works. And so we can make the theological statement that salvation is by faith alone. There's no reference to anything else. It's a theological conclusion. So if I preach this passage... I need to explicitly tell the, the listeners, this means salvation is by, is by grace through faith, by faith alone. Grace is not, we'll see grace later, but really the by faith alone is being highlighted here, okay? So everyone sees how I'm moving from, I'm moving into theological conclusions, and we know this, right? So this is not... I'm not asking you for a profound truth. I'm, help, I'm asking you to make a connection from the text and theology. We're making this connection here. Go ahead, Boboy. No, no, no. I'm not asking a question, Tim. I'm just making a signal to my son. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I have a question. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, for, for, for the master, master's level, uh, are we going to 
put this into a sen uh, I mean a par in the paragraph form. For this section, I want everyone to do bullet point because I want right. to, you're just listing those theological truths. Because what I what, what, what my recommendation, Sonny, is that when you preach, I want you to maybe include now that you like okay, the text teaches this. You should include that in your preaching at some point. So it do, it doesn't need okay. to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, 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 great question. So in this section, no one should be doing paragraph. Everyone should just do bullet point. Okay. Next, <clears throat> salvation has always been by faith in the Old and New Testament. So this is the conclusion from faith, for faith, for faith. Okay, and also in the reference to Habakkuk. 2-4. Okay? So again, I'm making a theological conclusion from the text. All right? And this was one of our questions. That was, what is from faith for faith? And so I'm saying it's salvation has always been by faith in the Old Testament to the New Testament. Okay? The gospel is the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So these two are connected. Right? If it's always been by faith, it's going to be the same. Right? Everyone tracking with me? I hope you are. Next bullet point. The gospel contains God's promise to save us and thus reveals his faithfulness to his promises. God is the faithful God. This is big. This is big. For in it, God's righteousness is revealed from faith for faith. Last point. The gospel contains Christ's righteousness, which is given to us by faith. So what, 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 from, from our discussion before, from our study, we noticed that righteousness had two components. There's a faithfulness component, and then there's this Christ's righteousness component. Okay? One last, one last statement here. Faith is the means by which the righteous live, while their works are an outworking of that living faith. Now you can say, Tim, where is that? The righteous shall live by faith. Now, maybe this is not a strong argument, but I think it is, because the word, the, let, let's write this out here, righteous shall live by faith. The reason why I'm including works is when you say righteous, you're thinking about uh, righteous works. You buy the righteous. The righteous have righteous works. So anyone who is in a law, a courtroom context, anyone who is a law-abiding citizen, the law-abiding citizen lives by his law-abiding, <laughs> right? <laughs> The one who is righteous, in accordance to the law, lives by their law keeping, okay? That's what, that's what is the reality, and that's what we would expect. So it's, it's quite profound that Habakkuk, and then Paul repeats and quotes Habakkuk, he says, the righteous shall live by his works. No! <laughs> no! The righteous shall live by faith that that is like that's like what you know that 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 should slap you in the face because it's 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 such a profound truth the righteous shall live by faith and thus we can say that because works is dealt with in romans 6 and romans 7 and romans 8 and we talked about that in christianity 101 and other places Faith uh, works is the result of living by faith. Very important. Your listeners, your members need to hear that truth. Okay, so again, what I'm trying to get at is as you prepare your sermon, 
write out some of these theological truths. Prepare. You know, they talk about having talking points. Have talking points in your sermon. Okay, so it's clear. It's concise. There's no confusion. Next, Christological truths. This is a big word for just saying Christ. What are the truths about Christ? What are the truths about Christ? Christ's sacrifice reveals God's power to save. So Christ's sacrifice is implied, uh, it's included in, in the idea of gospel. So we say gospel, be thinking Christ's sacrifice. In God's power to save, there is judicial power and there is resurrection power. <laughs> okay? We need to be acquitted in the court. Judicial power, right? We say the Supreme Court is all powerful. <laughs> Can they fly? No. Can they raise the dead? No. They are all powerful in the courtroom. They can acquit. They can declare guilty. Okay, so there is judicial power. Christ's sacrifice gives, uh, God's power is revealed in judicial power. But even if we're declared not guilty, we still will die, right? So we need the resurrection power, the power that raises the dead. If we are given the judicial power and that we are declared not guilty, then we can be removed from the curse of death and God uses his resurrection power, the creative power to resurrect us now spiritually and later physically. This is so important. Bull Boy and Danny, Romans 8. We are waiting for the adoption of the sons, the redemption of our bodies. Spiritual, spiritual resurrection, spiritual resurrection now. Physical resurrection just like Christ in the future, okay? So these are two foundational Christological truths. There's others. There's others we can talk about. You could talk about, maybe I want to add later, about, about union with Christ. We could really include that here. I, I, I should have included that there. Um, because of the idea, it's implied in the idea of gospel and also in faith. So again, be clear. We're not adding. We're not adding to the text. We're saying these are, these are implications. These are implied by the text itself. And so the key words by which they're included is gospel faith. And here, the key word is God's power. So we have, or in it, God's power. Okay, go ahead. Incredible book. When we, when you list that Christological truth, does, do, do we have to use the words as it is written in the text, or we use our own words? No, use your own words. Uh, it is helpful when you're. I would give. I would. This is what I do, Incredible Boy. If I'm preaching, I'm, I'm, I'm practical now. If I'm preaching, I would reference the specific word in the text. And then I would say, this means this, bam, and then give the Christological truth, okay? Or this implies, this infers this, okay? So you want to always make, in the, in, the, in the reader, make the connection with the text, so we're exegetical, but also distinguish because you're giving a, a deeper truth or significance. Because remember, Paul is going to get to those truths later Later in the book of Romans, you're just highlighting them now. You're drawing the, the, the attention to the reader now. Yeah. Great question. Excellent question and thought. Anyone so, else? Yeah. So follow up. So it, it doesn't, it, it should be that when you make that Christological truth by our using our word, it should not be a controversial statement. No, it, 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 should, it should not be. Now, maybe people debate the statement you make, but no, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be really controversial. So like, for example, this means salvation through faith alone. Now, that would be controversial with Catholics, right? But it should not be controversial. Yeah, it should not be controversial. Okay. So basically, so Tim, uh, basically um, the Christological 
uh, you know, papers or, or listing should be pertains to what Christ work and person. Yes. Yes. All right. No, excellent. So this is the person work. And also you could say a uh, title or role. Person work, work and role. And, and maybe the role and title is connected with the person. So I'm thinking of prophet, <coughs> priest, uh, king. Again, not always. Not always. You don't have to. You don't. You're not listing everything possible about Christ. You're, these are things to consider as you look for Christological truth, Sonny. Any other question? Is this making sense? I hope this is making sense. I hope. But, you're not uh, limited. Limit the, the the truth that we list is only limited to the passage that we choose, or the whole chapter of the where the passage belong. I would limit it to the passage because you don't want to be isolated. Limit to the passage you're studying, but if but if there's a strong connection, include it. You're going to see in a minute that I'm actually going to include two other passages in my sermon because they're connected. You're going to see that in a minute. Okay, you're going to see that in a minute. Okay. Next, Expo exposition of the text. Okay, Ex exposition of the text. All right. Here, all I'm going to do is just work line by line, phrase by phrase, just explain in my own words. What I would do, let's say, think about like, okay, I'm going to explain this passage to my class. I'm going to explain this passage to my wife or whoever. And just write in your own words the significances. So let me just read this through here, and I hope you can, you can, we've looked at Romans 1, 16, 17 so much. I hope that this will come, this will be familiar to you. Uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17 contains two complex sentences, which describes Paul's confidence in the gospel and its foundation. So confidence is Romans 16, foundation is Romans 117. In Romans 116a, Paul declares his state, namely that he is confident in the gospel, or that the gospel brings him boldness. In Romans 116b, Paul provides the reason for his confidence in the gospel. It is the gospel that God's power is revealed for our deliverance from God's final judgment and coming wrath. In the subsequent context, we see God's wrath is coming both in the present and also on the final day of judgment. So again, I'm just, I'm just adding new information. I'm just explaining what's there. Your explanation will be different. Again, don't be stressed. This is not, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, mine is maybe more in detail than yours. That's fine. That's literally, I, I did this in maybe 45 minutes, okay? Now, perhaps it will take longer for you. But, but um, again, you're not looking for new information. You're just writing out the text as if you were to be explaining it. If you, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't want you to be stressed, okay? We're just simply explaining it in our own words. Yours is going to be different than mine. Maybe yours is going to be simpler. Maybe yours is going to be more complex. I can see Sonny. I can see Boy. Maybe you're going more, more complex than me. That's, that's completely fine, okay? There is no limit. There's no, uh, it's really up to you, okay? Um, let me just finish here. Thus it is clear that God's salvation has benefit in the present and more importantly in eternity. Although salvation has both sense and, uh, senses, let me just erase this. Both senses, present and future, the future eternal sense is accented and more fundamental. God's promise in the Old Testament is to undo the curse of death. Thus, we see that salvation is primarily focused upon God giving eternal life and peace to those who have faith in his son. So here I'm making connections. I'm making connections with, from our study. Remember our word study? We, we made these connections in our word study, okay? So don't be afraid to bring other passages, like Bobo is saying, other passages that relate. Absolutely, okay? Absolutely, because that's what we're, we're trying to do, okay? Again, Please don't be stressed. This is just your own words. Um, I'm not going to judge you on content as if like, oh, you don't have this or that. Just, I want you to feel freedom and flexibility to do what you want to do. So we can read through here. Maybe you want to read this on your own time. But again, it's just my own explanation, okay? Then I have a theological outline. And literally, 
the theological outline is just taking the exegetical and then just turning it eternal. So I'm removing Paul, I'm removing Roman believers, and I'm putting uh, just general, the confidence of the gospel. The gospel brings Christians, generic, Christians into a state of confidence. The reason for this confidence is that God's power is revealed for their eternal salvation from his judgment on the last day. So again, I'm just, I'm just giving my, uh, the eternal, it's very close, okay? So it's almost saying the same thing, just going from Paul's context to all contexts, okay? All right? And then again, the same thing with this theological summary. I'm just taking the exegetical summary, looking at the theological summary, and I'm just bringing it together, okay? Now look here. Look at my big idea. Look at how I change it slightly. Look at this. Big idea, it's shorter. It's timely. There is some form of call to action. Okay? This is the this is the the main topic. See that that's the main topic and then this is the complement. Okay? So that's it. Go ahead. Someone want to ask a question? So the main big idea is this. We must be confident in the gospel. So I'm calling, I'm calling, I'm calling the readers. Paul is confident. We must be confident. I must be confident. You must be confident in the gospel. Why? So I made the, I made the executive decision. I'm answering the question, why? And then I'm just giving the second half. So this is verse 16, and then this is verse 17. Because it is the revelation and fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. So there you have, you have a reference to Scripture. Uh, you have a reference to fulfillment, to revelation, or re revealing. You could say revealing. It's more condensed. And you, you, you want to know something? I have preached this sermon, I want to say, maybe three or four times. I've taught on Romans at least uh, one, two, three. I want to say I've taught on Romans five times, and I'm telling you right now, this is different than the way I've preached in the past, okay? Because there's many different ways of saying it, all right? So don't feel like I have to do it just like Tim or I have to get it. No, because the truths are the same. The practical might be different. The practical might be tweaked. Maybe I missed something I want to clarify. The, 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 the theological truths. Look at this. Look at this. These theological truths did not change. I've always included these when I preached. Every time I've included them, okay? But the homiletics, the practical, I've done it differently. And if I do it next month or next year, it will be different, okay? So I, I, I'm seeing some stressed faces. Don't be stressed, okay? Just try. Let's try without pressure, okay? You're going to come back to this next year and say, what was I doing? That's fine. Just, let's, let's try. Let's go out the basketball court and let's take the three-pointer. Maybe it's an air ball. Maybe it's a backboard. Eventually, you're going to make it, okay? So let's just try. Do not be stressed, all right? From here on out, we will have a workshop session on Thursday night. Um, if no one's there, that's fine. Thursday night and Sunday night, okay? Well, actually, would you prefer Sunday night? Does everyone prefer Sunday night? Is Sunday night better for you? Sunday night. Okay, so let's, let's make a change. Every Sunday night, not Thursday night, let's change it. Every Sunday night from 7.30 to 9, 9.30, we will have a workshop, okay? Until the end, all right? Even if everyone comes and just w w w wants to work on their assignments, I will just sit here. I have 
so many other things to do. So I can just sit here, I, I can be typing, and then you can say, I have a question. Okay, I will help you, okay? Just as if we're in class, all right? So let's just finish up here, and then we'll take our next break. Um, so then here, Christ and the gospel. Here is Christ and the gospel. I'm making connections so that I can, again, there's a lot of overlap with Christological truths, okay? So notice here. I accent the gospel. The gospel is mentioned in this passage explicitly three times. There's three references, 16a, 16b, 17a, okay? So in any one of these times, I can, I can say, and what is the gospel? The gospel is this, okay? Um, but we need to define it. The gospel is presupposed, but it is not, the, the definition is understood, but it is not explicitly defined in Romans 1, 16 and 17. We must define it so that we can call those when we preach to believe it. <laughs> so I have noticed that it's defined in here, it's defined in here, it's defined in here. So I, will, I can use all of them if I have time, I can pick one of them. Uh, um, but I'm going to, to reference these and I am going to define I am going to define and explain it in the sermon. So I'm going to have my homiletical outline, I'm going to have my big idea, but I am going to uh, I'm gonna maybe like something like this, okay? Something like this, okay? Uh, we must be confident in the gospel. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Okay, what is the gospel? And then I'm just going to define it. I'm going to say, Paul defines for us the gospel in Romans 1, 1 to 5. And then we go there and talk about it. Resurrection power, escape from the dead. Blah, 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 blah. What else is the gospel? Romans 3, 21 to 26. Go to Romans 3, 21 to 26. And if you still have time, Romans 5. So this is what the gospel is, all right? Okay, so I, I want to be, I, we want it to be clear, okay? Um, and then there's other things talking about the righteousness of God. I want to really highlight that. I want to highlight what faith means. Okay. I want to include an idea of union with Christ. So again, this is me thinking about, I'm going to preach this. These are things that I really want to highlight that are not explicit, but we should always be talking union with Christ. Union with Christ. We are in union with Christ. This is not a peripheral issue. This is a foundational issue by which we receive every blessing. And our sin is transferred. And by God's grace, Christ's righteousness is given to us. Okay? So I'm, in my mind, I'm saying I want to really highlight these. I'm going to include these in some way in my manuscript or in my outline when I preach. Okay? Then I'm going to create my homiletical outline so it's just timely. Our confidence in the gospel. The gospel brings us into a state of confidence. The reason is that God's resurrecting in judicial power to save us now and eternally both from his judgment and wrath is contained in the gospel. There it is. We receive this salvation through faith within Jesus Christ without any other factor or limitation. So I was more wordy. You could just say we receive this by faith alone. You can say that. You know, I, when I preach, I'm more of a technical, wordy. Some people are very, uh, uh, they do a really much better job, like catching and stuff. And so it's up to you. And then uh, point number two, the foundation of the gospel in the Old Testament, God reveals his righteousness to us in the gospel. Christ, God's righteousness is his faithfulness to his promise. God's righteousness is also the righteousness of his son, which he gives us by faith. So those are two things that I want to define righteousness as. And then lastly, the basis for the gospel is the Old Testament. And that's it. Okay? And then this is beyond the scope of this class, but if you were to preach, if this was also homiletics, I would prepare some illustrations. I would look for some illustrations. I would look for some application. Maybe in, an, in another handout, I can give you some application that I would include. And then... You don't have to do this. I just did it to help. Maybe I'll add the illustrations and applications by the end. Again, not assigned. This is not part of the assignments, okay? Um, 
but I have an introduction. So listen to my introduction. Okay, see how my introduction just fits perfectly. What embarrasses you? Dirty clothes? An immature friend or family member? Many times Christians view the gospel as something embarrassing. It's an embarrassment. It's something that, it's shameful. We find it difficult to share because it is viewed poorly by others. It is a red stain on their white shirt. But what if the gospel was, in fact, the opposite? What if the gospel didn't bring shame but brought confidence? What if the gospel was the very thing that one was proud of? For Paul, the gospel was not something to be embarrassed of. It was not an item of shame that he had to overcome. Rather, it was the very foundation for his boasting. And you're like, what? <laughs> How could this be? I'm glad you asked the question why. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans 1, 16 and 17, and let's hear about why the gospel brings Paul confidence. So like, I'm just, that's, that is, I'm creating, the introduction creates, it grabs, it grabs the audience. <laughs> They want to, they want to, they, you know, then you read the passage. Now you got them. Now you got them, okay? Conclusion. Let's listen to the conclusion. This is at the very end. Rather than being a source of shame and embarrassment, the gospel is and must be the source of our confidence. It is through the gospel that we have assurance that we will stand justified on the final day in God's courtroom and vindicated and be vindicated. The amazing reality is that the verdict has already been brought into the present through the sacrificial blood of Jesus and when we put our faith in him alone. That final judicial verdict is now. It's been declared now. It is the verdict that we know that we have and will escape the curse of death and forever be with God in his presence and be heirs of the world and the age to come. Thus, God's power is not only judicial power, to declare the guilty innocent, but also resurrecting power to free us from the grave, creating us new creatures alive forevermore. This truth is not God's plan B, <laughs> but plan A. We see that even in the Old Testament, the righteous one is not justified by his works, nor does he live in right relationship with his creator, the Lord, by works. Rather, he lives his life in obedient faith, obedient faith, trusting in God's Son, Jesus Christ, for freedom from sin now and eternal life to come. It is this good news that ought to give us incredible confidence. This confidence first reveals itself in our lives practically, but also in our ability and desire to share the good news with those around us, following Paul's eager desire and example. So coming back here, notice how, and this will be also in, this will be before my conclusion, but in that, that the gospel is for us daily. We could say daily here. Not just for our, not just for evangelism, but also for sanctification. Okay, not just for, evangelism, but for our sanctification. So, I would not have prepared this if I did my conclusion and introduction first. Cigarado, I would not, okay? Cigarado, I would not. All right, so, I just, I, I did this to give you an example to see the connection. Once you work through all the processes, you see you see where the introduction is, you see the big idea, and then of course you would have your, your homiletical outline, and then the conclusion is at the end, and then what is the title? I, I haven't even thought of a title. Maybe um, uh, our shape, the world's shape is our confidence, something like that, <laughs> right? It's this, it's this wordplay. Um, the world's shame is our confidence. Go ahead. God behind the gospel. Yeah, you can do that too. That's good. That'll preach. Yeah. So this, you see how the, the, the sky is the limit, okay? But I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, that it's, it's, 
doing the exegesis just opens up the world. It opens up, it opens up our eyes to see uh, the possibilities. And there's many different ways you can preach and teach this, okay? So it's eight o'clock. Let's take a break. Let's take a break. And then after the break, we're going to go into breakout sessions. I'm going to divide you up into groups. It might take a little bit of time. And I want you to look at an assignment that you want to start working on to turn in next. Okay. So in your group, there'll be either two or three. I'll do two or three, mostly two, um, but perhaps three. Um, I want you to, to discuss or to, to, to this determine maybe you want to start working on the intra or inter, and then I'll go to each group and talk with you about your plan. And we can start doing the assignments, and this will be moving towards uh, resubmitting as a final, as a final um, project. If we can, if each one of you can do your own passage of scripture as a final project, um, I will be so happy. This is the goal, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a 10 minute break. And then when we come back, we will have the, the breakout sessions.